Well, good morning, church. My name is Chris Papenfus. I'm one of the pastors here on staff at First Covenant. Thank you for braving the snow. If you're still using it as an excuse, it's February, people, in Minnesota. You all here, you, you know that already, right? Truly preaching to the choir. Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth that I utter today, may they be true, may they be helpful, and may it be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We are in a series, as Becca pointed out, entitled, The Rocks Will Cry Out. Uh, the image is one of a uh, kind of a, a stack of rocks. It's called a cairns. So this is uh, bringing Bill great delight. Uh, Bill cairns every time he comes into church during this series. Bill, we're not worshiping you. We're Carol. Don't get a big head about the whole thing. But uh, it's this sense of learning what it means to worship God. And we're using as kind of uh, the background or, or the metaphor the, the altars that Abram, or Abraham, as he will become, constructs as part of his worship. And worship is simply this ascribing worth to God. So maybe this morning, already you're sitting here going, wow, I feel like I've done a little bit of worshiping this morning. In prayer and in song, I, I feel like I've diminished a little bit of myself and elevated God. So worship team, choir, thank you for leading us in that work. So we're exploring these, these altars as sacred act of worship in the altars of Abraham. An altar is simply a geographical location where God met with humanity and a sacrifice was made. And the biblical narrative celebrates Abraham as a man of faith, as was read for us from the book of Hebrews earlier. Last week, we visited the first of Abram's altars, the altar of praise. The Christian sacrifice of praise isn't mere thankfulness over the blessings God has provided you in your life. We are the living sacrifice offered on the altar of praise, which is expressed in our faithful obedience to God. If you want to know what worship of praise looks like in your life, it's how you live in obedience to what God has called you to when we leave this place on Sunday mornings. That is our offering of praise unto the Lord. This morning we will be exploring the sacrifice of prayer shaped by the journey. Now the very first expression of worship that I learned and I suspect many of us learned was actually prayer. This is, this is some of the earliest memories. My parents uh, taught me prayers and I regurgitated those prayers. That was how we learned. We learned to pray and we memorize certain prayers and then we say them at the right time. All right, my favorite meal blessing, anybody remember? Rub-a-dub-dub, -dub. thanks for the grub. I know, it's very sacrilegious. I didn't say there were good prayers that they taught him. There's just this moment of let's pause here, God, and remember that this food that we are about to eat comes from you. So there's these different prayers that we begin to learn and we begin to incorporate into our lives. Then maybe perhaps we move into a heightened awareness of communal prayer or individual devotional prayer. Maybe you begin to yearn for that time when we can gather together as the church body and collectively we pray together. Or maybe you're one of those people that say, I look forward to those times of individual prayer when I can just kind of withdraw from the, the challenges of the world and be with God. And still others, I'll call them the prayer elite among us. Now they have learned how to pray like St. Basil instructs us. This is how you pray continually, he says. Not by offering prayer in words, but by joining yourself to God through your whole way of life. 
so that your life becomes one continuous and uninterrupted prayer. Have you ever met somebody like that? They're a walk in prayer. You know it. You know when, they, when you are in their midst. So maybe between one of these three, you are feeling like, that's kind of me. That describes my prayer life. Maybe I'm uh, just learning some of the memorized prayers and saying them at mealtime. Maybe you're somebody who loves to gather together and pray with the body or on your own. And maybe you're one of these prayer elites that are indeed a walking prayer. Well, before you start beating yourself up for not being maybe what St. Basil sets as the pinnacle of prayer, I want to give you a little bit of reassurance. That doesn't describe Abraham either. If you'll turn with me to Genesis chapter 12, we're going to be looking at the next altar that Abram constructs. Genesis chapter 12. And let's see, when we last left Abram last week, he had just completed his journey to Canaan and constructed an altar of praise in the valley of Shechem under the tree of Moreh. There he encountered God. God appeared to him there and he built an altar and offered his sacrifice of praise, which was his obedience to follow where God told him to go. And then continuing on with the text. Verse 8 and 9. From there, he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel to the west and Ai to the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. Abram builds his second altar on the top of a hill located between Bethel and Ai. So he finds a high spot right between Bethel and Ai. Bethel in the Hebrew is pronounced Bet-El. It means the house of God. And A-E means heap of ruins. So on a hill between the house of God and the heap of ruins, Abram builds an altar and called on the name of the Lord. Is there anybody here this morning that this serves as a pretty good picture of your spiritual life? I'm somewhere between the house of God and a heap of ruins, right? Maybe I'm leaning one way more than the other, but this is just kind of our life. We live in this tension between the, this beautiful pronunciation that we sang and proclaimed a moment ago, this realization of who God is when we gather together in his house and we sing praises to him, and then the rest of our life sometimes feel like we're just on the cusp of a heap of ruins, but I love that Abram, with Bethel, Bethel to the west, and Ai to the he east, he finds a high spot and he builds an altar and he calls on the name of the Lord. This is the second time this phrase is used in the book of Genesis. The first is in reference to the human creation after the birth of Seth to Adam and Eve. And it says that, at that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. People began to call out to God. Now, the action calling can be translated as proclaiming, crying out, inviting, pronouncing. These are all interchangeable words that are embedded in the Hebrew. The image associated with the Hebrew is a, is a person's action as they come upon another person. So it's relational in this. You might begin to call out to somebody when you see them across the parking lot. I'm so glad you're here. Don't slip on the ice. Okay, it's this sense we're gathering together. We see somebody. It's relational in its context. As you begin to proclaim, as you begin to call out, as you begin to invite, all of this is embedded in this understanding of crying out to the Lord. People were saying, I desire to cry out to the Lord. I'm calling to God because I want relationship with him. 
If you want an enriching Bible study, just go to your favorite Bible search engine and type in the words, call on the name of the Lord. Phenomenal, the texts that come up from that. And just spend some time reading these passages of Scripture. When do the authors use this term, call on the name of the Lord, and what is going on? The Scripture texts that appear illuminate the purpose of calling on the name of the Lord, both for salvation, which in essence is saying, God, save me, as well as sanctification. God, make me. When we call on the name of the Lord, Nearly all of the passages throughout our scripture speak of calling the name of the Lord in one of these two areas. God, save me from the condition in the world that I'm in. Save me, deliver me. I desperately need you to come in and intervene. Or, God, make me into that which you have intended and in fact created me to be. God, save me. God, make me. So Abram, Having now heard from the Lord in Ur and having Yahweh appear to him in the valley of Shechem, now desires more. He wants to encounter God, encounter God again and again and again. Abram, in this one action of building an altar, is moving from an isolated meeting to desiring a relationship with the Almighty. He builds an altar and he prays, he cries out, he he proclaims, he invites, he pronounces on the hill between the house of God and the heap of ruins, Abram prays. Church, prayer is how we do relationship with the Almighty. Prayer is how we communicate with God. This is important. God can get our attention in countless ways. And we can create religions and religious practices in order to try and coerce God or delude ourselves or define ourselves. But if you genuinely want a relationship with God, that is found through nurturing a life of prayer which is dependent on the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul writes to the church in Rome, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. To the church in Ephesus, he writes, For through Jesus, we both, meaning Jews and Gentiles, have access to the Father by one Spirit. Then he goes on in chapter 6 to say, Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. See, Paul gives the impression, as does St. Basil, that, that, or Basil, not Basil, sorry. Sorry, St. Basil. Uh, that prayer, prayer isn't a part of your life. It is your life. Prayer isn't a part of your worship. It is the conversation that emerges through a relationship with the God who dwells in you and you in God. This, Paul says, is essential to who we are as Christ's followers. When we perceive the character and will of God with greater clarity, when we better see who God is, we also see who we are. Let me say that again. When we enter into prayer, we see more clearly who God is. That's wonderful. But in doing so, we also see more clearly who we are. And that's terrifying. And I think if we can be really brutally honest with ourselves for just a second, that's why we don't pray, isn't it? God, I don't don't really want to see me for who I really am. I prefer to live in the illusion that I'm a good person, that I got my life all put together. God, I really, I, I'd love to see you for who you are as long as you stay at a safe distance. But that burning sun that we just talked about, that, that in comparison to everything else that I spend so much time and energy in is just a flicker of a candle. 
I don't want to see me for who I really am compared to the glory and goodness of God. And so I don't want to pray. Prayer is risky. Prayer demands humility. But it's who we are called to be. If there is one habit we as First Covenant Church need to develop or deepen this next year, I believe it should be prayer. Every single one of us. I don't want to put a committee together. I don't want to make this the job of the elder board. I don't want it to come as a congregational vote that says, okay, should we all pray more? Can we just make this commitment? Say, God, help me learn to pray more. Help me learn to pray better. Draw me into this relationship that we might be in conversation together, God, you and I. Now, lest you think I'm being a bit overly dramatic about this, let's return to Abram. After building an altar of prayer situated between the house of God and the heap of ruins, Abram travels to the Negev. Anybody know what Negev means? The dry. The dry. The Negev is a desert. All right? They're not, I'm not saying that the Hebrews are super creative. They call it the dry, the, the region of this desert. They call it the dry. And the text goes on to say this. Now there was a famine in the land and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. Imagine that, living in the dry and then the famine hits. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is your wife? Then they will kill me, but will let you live. Say you are my sister so that I will be treated well for your sake and my life will be spared because of you. Now my wife will tell you I am not a romantic person. But even I know this is a dumb idea. There's a reason that Abram is not the patron saint of Valentine's Day, right? Kudos to Sarah. I mean, Sarai, she's got to be at least 65 years old or older, okay? She must be looking great at 65. Kudos for her. She's taking good care of herself. Now, it could be women have told me children wreck their bodies, she is barren. Maybe that's working in her favor. I don't know. I don't know. But, but Abram looks at Sarai and says, we're about to enter into Egypt here. You are beautiful. You are going to gain the attention of Pharaoh's court. And they're going to kill me and take you. So let's just tell them you're my sister. Now we, we can't lose what's going on here. Abram leaves the altar of prayer the altar of, of communal relationship with God in conversational God, getting to know God for who God is and seeing himself for who he is. He leaves that altar of prayer situated on the hill between the house of God and the heap of ruins. He travels towards the place that is dry and there he experiences famine. The food disappears. The water that nourishes is dried up. The God who appeared to Abram is nowhere to be found here in the Negev. So what does Abram do? Does he go back to the altar of prayer? Does he call out on the name of the Lord? Does he build an altar right there in the desert? He takes matters into his own hands and he goes to Egypt. Abram is no longer acting in faith. He begins acting out of fear. When they see how beautiful you are, they will kill me. No longer acting in faith, Abram begins acting in falsehood. Say, you are my sister, so that I will be treated well. This is not the image of Abram that we've been building up in our minds from Hebrew chapter 11. This pillar of faith. This isn't the great man recorded in that book. 
Where is the man of God who calls on the name of the Lord when things get tough? But it gets even worse. When Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was a very beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake. And Abram acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, male and female servants, and camels. Let's be perfectly clear what's going on here. Abram is prostituting his wife for his own gain. I don't think God is pleased with this. The text goes on to say, The Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram. What have you done to me, he said. Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I would take her to be my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abram to his men and they sent him on his way with his wife in everything he had. Abram is not only acting out of fear and falsehood, but he is failing at doing the will of God. Do you remember God's promise to Abram at the beginning of chapter 12? God tells him, I will make you into a great nation, Abram. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. Or you could translate that, or you will be seen as blessed. And then the Lord says this, I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Pharaoh isn't blessed by Abram. Egypt is not better off because Abram came to visit. No one is singing the praises of Abram or Abram's God in the streets of Cairo. We shake our heads at the unfaithfulness of Abram and scratch our heads wondering how history could preserve, perceive him as such a man of faith. But let's stop for just a moment and ask ourselves, am I any different? Am I any different? Rather than going to the altar of prayer, carving out the space between the house of God and the heap of ruins in your life, are you taking matters into your own hands, wandering into Egypt, no longer acting in faith, but acting out of fear and falsehood? A failure at what God has called you to. You see, we cannot do what God calls us to do without taking God with us where we go. Or more appropriately stated, we cannot do what God calls us to do if we're blind to where God already is and where we are going. See, I, I believe in, in, in Abram's mind, he was, he was going to Egypt and, and he had left God on the hill between Bethel and Ai. And so he, he's figured, I got to be resourceful. I got to take care of numero uno. I got to look out for myself. But he fails to live up to what God called him to do and to be. We let our fear lead us into falsehood just like Abram. We may even feel like it must be God's will because look at how the blessings are pouring in. It must be God's will because my investments are up and the economy is strong. It must be God's will because I'm comfortable, safe, and secure. It must be God's will because I'm increasing in all the cultural entrapments around me. Church, we can flourish by all worldly accounts and fail at doing the will of God because we have left God on the hill between the house of God and the heap of ruins, leaving him there comfortable, and we're refusing to take God with us into the places where God brings us. And we succumb to the cultural entrapments around us and we wrongly assume that we must be blessed. God must be okay with this. You think Abram, as the camels started flooding in and the donkeys and the male servants and the female servants, you think he's thinking, God must be pleased with me. Otherwise, I wouldn't get all these blessings. This must be the right thing to do. We cannot forsake 
the relationship forged in prayer. When we silence all the noise of the culture around us, those who would misuse the name of the Lord, those who would mock scripture, we have to silence all of that to sit at the feet of God in relationship and say, God, speak. I call out to you. Abram steps away from the altar of prayer and he forgets who God called him to be. He reverts back to what his own sinful human nature enslaved him to be. We see in Egypt, we see Abram's true colors. We see that he is a coward, a liar, and a fraud. How do I know that? Turn to the person sitting next to you and say, how does he know that? Because Abram does the exact same thing in chapter 20 with King Abimelech of Gerar. Seven chapters later, Abram says to his wife Sarai, Hey, you know what? We're kind of moving into hostile territory. They're going to find you to be a beautiful woman. What do you... Let's try this again. I'll say you're my sister and I will be blessed. He does the exact same thing to King Abimelech of the city of Gerar. Coincidentally, you know where the city of Gerar is located? The Negev. The place of dryness. See, this is who Abram really is. And when he neglects his life of prayer, he resorts back to his old sinful self. Jesus tells his disciples in John chapter 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples. When we stop living by faith, when you stop calling to God for salvation and sanctification, when you stop calling out to God in prayer, God, save me, God, make me, when you are no longer faithful to remain in the vine drawing the nutrients needed to produce fruit, when you are no longer saying, Jesus, be my Savior and my Lord, when we step away from the altar of prayer on the hilltop between the house of God and the heap of ruins, we cut ourselves off from the relationship with the one who saved you in order to remake you, the one who has entered into your life so that in the dry places you will know the nourishment that God is pouring into you because Jesus is the vine and we are the branches and we must remain in him and we stay anchored through Jesus through prayer. Remain in me. Abram, you, me, apart from God, we are nothing. And that altar of prayer is where we cry out to the Lord and are reminded who we are. We're reminded who we are. And many of us expect to come to that altar of prayer And we come reluctantly. And we come expecting a severe brow beating from God because of our negligence. We come to the altar of prayer to see who God is and see ourselves for who we are. And when we approach with humility and sheepishness, scared for our very lives, and we kneel at the altar of prayer, we discover who we really truly are. And you know who that is? Children of the Almighty God. What a page turner. Wait, God, wait a minute. You've seen what I've been doing. You see that I prostituted my wife in Egypt? How could you still love me? Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev. 
with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and in gold. From the Negev, he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier and where he had first built an altar. There, Abram called on the name of the Lord. Abram is championed as a man of faith in the book of Hebrews, not because he was a pillar of godliness, but because when he messed up, and let's be honest, he messes up a lot. He eventually finds himself back at the place where he calls on the name of the Lord. I believe Abram moved from place to place until he came to his senses. I believe that Abram went moping along through Canaan until he came to, that, to, to Bethel, the house of God, and there he realized, my life's not right. I'm a lot closer to A.E. than I am to the house of God. And he went back to the place on the hill between the house of God and the place of ruin, and he called on the name of the Lord. I don't know what Abram prayed. I don't know what that prayer was like. But I believe that his prayer was different. I believe that his prayer was shaped by the journey of his own failings, falsehood, and fear. I don't know if this morning you are climbing the hill coming from the house of God or the heap of ruins. It really doesn't matter. This morning, before we leave, we are going to gather around the altar and offer up our sacrifice of praise. This morning, we are going to gather around the altar, offer up, offer up our sacrifice of praise and prayer. We are going to gather together to say, God, we come desiring relationship. We desire to see you for who you are. And in your goodness, God, in your gentleness, may you help us see us for who we are. This morning we will be praying through four stages of prayer, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. And I will be leading us through this along with the, the choir and others. But let us just enter into that space and say, God, before we walk out of here today, we desire to lift our eyes towards you. May you call us to you. Let's pray. Gracious God, we begin, Lord, in our, in our prayer with this prayer of adoration. God, you are so gracious. You are so good. You are so holy. You are above all else. God, you are the sun and everything else is but a flickering candle in comparison to your illuminance, your goodness, your holiness, your righteousness, your love. God, you alone are God and we are not. And so God, we call out to you and we sing that we exalt you. As we see God for who God is, allow that for the briefest moment to shed illumination into your life as to who you are. And let us enter into this space of confession, in this stillness, in this silence. Lift up to God. Acknowledge the, those moments in the dryness of your own life when you have turned away from God in pursuit of something else. God, in this stillness, hear our prayers of confession. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways in the glory of your name. Amen.
acknowledging who God is and seeing ourselves for who we are invites us into a prayers of thanksgiving when we can look around us and say, God, maybe these things, these blessings around me that I have come so, become so comfortable with, that I've treated as my entitlement are gifts from you. It's good to acknowledge that. I invite us in this time a prayer of thanksgiving. Go ahead and just speak out the things in your life that you are thankful to God for. Let us lift this up as a noise of praise to our God. God, so much that we are thankful for. And above all else, we are thankful, God, that you have not forgotten us. And so knowing, Lord, who you are and confessing who we are and seeing your um, working in our life and that which we are so thankful for, we come now in this time and we turn our hearts to you and we cry out, God. We cry out for those in our life who we know need your healing touch who we know need a relationship with you, who we know need hope. God, we we see their faces in our mind. We have their names at the tip of our tongue. Would you draw near to them, Lord? Holy Spirit, do a work around them that would capture their attention. May you do a work within them that would bring you glory. God, we lift up those whom we know and love. Lord, we also lift up the community that we live in. We pray for our neighbors. We pray, God, for the nation in this incredibly tumultuous, politically divided time. God, we pray that there would be a miracle that takes place that people would come to you not with an agenda, but come to you with humility to be able to acknowledge their own brokenness and sinfulness. God, may you do this work in our leaders. And God, may you then work through them in doing incredible, miraculous work of coming back together. God, we pray for our broken world. We pray, Lord, for those who this morning as they gathered to worship, were fearful of their lives. Those of our brothers and sisters who are facing persecution, for those nations in the world who are trying desperately to quiet the voice of the church, for those who have been their whole lives, just sense that you're just on the periphery but they've not encountered you, Lord. We, we lift them up to you and we pray for them. God, we pray for our world and our brokenness. And we look for that and pray earnestly for that day you come back and set all things right. And finally, God, search us, know us. God, save us, make us. In the stillness, Lord, may we open our lives to you and ask where is it that you want to do a new work in each of us?